There we go. I was like, why isn't it working? There we go. Okay, perfect. Okay, friends. Hey, I'll just mute you. There we go. Make it easy. Um, I'm going to go ahead and... Or I guess the music already ended, huh? I'll just turn the music off. <laughs> Can you hear me, Kay? Yeah, you're good. Oh, shoot. I can hear myself. Let me mute myself. I don't want to hear myself talk. Okay, okay. I think we're good now. I think I got all the fun stuff done. Okay, all right. I blah, blah, blah. Oh, stream deck's right in front of me. There we go. Hello, hi friends. They can't hear you yet. <laughs> I'm like staring at my friend Kaylee on the other side. <laughs> hi everyone. Uh, <laughs> welcome to the live stream. Welcome to our first or second, I should say, um, official um, Crescent City parts three and four, which is very exciting that we are officially diving into these last two sections of Crescent City. Um, this is... I think kind of the best part of the book, in my opinion, um, it is the most intense. It is, uh, it has a lot of information thrown at you, very similar to the first section, which has a lot of information thrown at you. Um, so I'm really excited to just kind of dive in and discuss this with you guys. Um, and for anyone on TikTok, I'm going to end the TikTok live stream in about two ish, three ish minutes. So if you want to head over on YouTube, you should go ahead and do that. Um, cause that's where all the fun's going to happen. Um, hi everyone. Hello, hello, hello. I see all the highs coming in. Um, so before we get started, I thought it was very appropriate to, because this is a book of very much about friendship, I thought it was appropriate to bring in, um, my best friend. This is, I would say the Danica to my Bryce, or she would probably say it's the opposite. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but she is, uh, this is my, like I call her every day. She probably knows more. She's been around before book talk was a thing. She, uh, I don't even know what else to say about you, but like, <laughs> I'm like staring at her on Zoom. Like, I don't know how else to introduce her, but uh, this is my best friend. This is Kaylee. Um, so I'm going to officially introduce her and I wanted her to come on because she just finished Crescent City about, I don't know, a few days ago, I think. I think officially you finished a few days ago. Yeah. So she finished on Monday. So you guys can see her ready. There she is. Say hi. <laughs> Yeah. So if, by the way, if you see me looking here, it's cause she's on the screen for me. So I'm like looking at her directly. Um, but this is Kaylee, the Kaylee, um, and I have known each other for Kaylee. How long? Yeah. Yeah. I said, really? Oh my gosh. It has been like eight years. Yeah. Yeah, so Kaylee and I worked together um, at a summer camp program, and then we just kind of became best friends. I moved states. She still lives in California. I live in Texas, and we probably FaceTime each other every day, multiple times during the day, multiple hours. Yeah, she has a young son, and um, it's gotten to the point now where he's just used to seeing my face. Yeah, um, legitimately. Oh, yeah. there we go. Now you can hear her. Sorry. They couldn't hear you. Oh, no. What I up? fixed it. I fixed it. <laughs> I fixed it. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry. I was like, I forgot she was muted. That was my bad. That was my bad. Um, okay. So Kaylee is a reader, but she typically listens to audiobooks. Um, I, yep. because of book talk, made her read um, from, no, I made you read Akatar first, right? I definitely read Akatar first because you, the rage and abridged, like, synopsis of what throne of glass was i'm like i'm not reading that sarah yeah so he gave me akatar and i was like <laughs> yeah yeah so i oh. should say that um if you've ever heard me talk about when i was reading throne of glass um kaylee was pregnant at the time and yeah. um she i called her and she was like oh here i'm gonna go ahead and end the live on tiktok bye friends oh that's not the ending the button <gasps> end it keeps giving me stickers there we go okay there we go okay um so uh she so when I finished uh I think I finished Empire of Storms I called Kaylee and um I was like are you gonna read this and she was like no I'm pregnant I don't have time to read a and eight book series and I was like okay I'm just gonna tell you what happened because I think Kaylee can attest to the fact that I got on the phone and I was visibly upset <laughs> 
visibly like what is this really happening yeah yeah so kaylee didn't read it and i gave her the worst explanation of throne of glass i've ever given to anyone and um then basically now it's been a full year and you're on air of fire (laughs) Yeah, very but, slowly. Very slowly. She's on air fire, and she, yeah. um, and she doesn't. She only knows about the very end of Empire Stars, but she doesn't know the connections to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there is awful retelling in her emotional state. Yeah, reading yeah. it for the first time. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Well, so anyway, so she so she's read all of Avatar, she's in the middle of uh Throne of Glass. She was reading Air of Fire from Blood and Ash and Crescent City at the same time, which I think you're a psycho. Yeah. Yeah, she's in the middle of the Crown of Guild of Bones right now. <laughs> yeah, she's in the middle of the Crown of Guild of Bones and um it, that, it's so good. And you finished Crescent City when? Like a few days ago? On Monday, I finished it, and I was like, "Okay." <sighs> so, what did you think of it once you finished it? I, I was like, "Okay, this 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 got real good," and I'm I'm happy that I finished it because for a hot second, you had to talk me off the ledge. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kaylee called me like I think it was over the weekend. She had finished part three. You had gotten awful. you had gotten past the barge. I believe so, yeah. And she called me just totally cursing out Hunt and wanted nothing to do this with him. Is, this is bullshit. I was legit. I didn't I didn't pick the book up back until like Sunday. I think I called you on Friday. Yeah. Like yeah. I needed a full like 48 yeah. hour moment of like I can't even. I can't even. Yeah. So she yeah, it was about a 45 minute phone call to talk her off the ledge because she was so yeah. upset. And then it was about a two days for her to finally get back into it yeah and then when you and finished it you were really happy y'all, y'all were right it was good it was, it was good. good it was good because up until that point I was like okay things are happening my wheels are turning and I'm like awful with predictions so I saw nothing coming yeah and yeah I was like this yeah. motherfucker yeah. This and if, and if you think like, and if you think I'm mean to you guys, just know with my best friend, I'm just as cruel because um, oh my God. I think what? it was like <laughs> it was like three chapters in and I was like, Micah's really hot, isn't he? And I was like sending you like yes. Micah fanfic. <laughs> I was like, OK, yeah, whatever. He's he's mysterious. All right. That's fine. You guys lost it. Lost it. Yeah, I was kind of a jerk. Totally. You totally were. I was like, oh, yeah, we'll see. Ah." Yeah, yeah. So, um, and now she's finished Crescent City. You're going to read. You really liked it in the end. I did. I did. From your Discord question, I gave it a 4.5 only because of my meltdown after part three. Fair. And that still still haunts me. That's fair. (sighs) What was your favorite part in the book? I think my favorite part of the book had to be um this is like spoiler free right yeah you can yeah yeah. you can you can do you can do spoilers okay Okay. when she makes the drop yeah and her and danica are talking about like what's going on how she's like hasn't really been able to like move on yeah their friendship like that interaction i think was a hundred times better than their interactions in the beginning because that is just like their banter day to day. Yeah. And at the end it was like, eh, okay, yeah. yeah, you guys are real. This is real life friendship. Yeah. Uh, and that was my favorite part. Well, and I was going to say, I think before you got to that, you were like, I don't know why you keep calling me Danica. And I was like, and I was like, Kaylee, you have to keep reading <laughs> because Kaylee tends to send me messages like, Danica's drop conversation and she's yes we have yes. serious I am the, I am definitely the Danica in this <laughs> yes let's, let's be very clear you're definitely the smarter one of the two of us <laughs> <laughs> not all the time sometimes I have really stupid questions yeah but you figured but... out the riddle in Akatar way faster than I did I guess that's true. Well, and I didn't even finish. I didn't really figure that one out. I was like, mm, and then as it got closer yeah. to her, like going through that whole situation with yeah. Amarantha. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, um, so now she's, yeah. so now she's reading, what are you reading right now? Crown of Guild of Bones and Air Fire? 
Yeah, those are the only two. I've been like, I've been waiting for this Crescent City wave to kind of like roll out. Yeah. Yeah. Because trying to read anything after that, it's like. (sighs) Yeah. Yeah. I get that. I get that. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for coming on. I mean, I yeah, know you have to go take care of your baby who's absolutely adorable and your husband just got yeah. home. My, yeah. my other BFF who's, where is he in the other room? Yeah. They're watching YouTube. Oh, cool. Fun stuff. But well, they're not watching. I know. I know. It's fine. Well, we will, uh, after this is over, Kaylee and I are going to go play some video games. I don't know what we're playing tonight. Oh, we're definitely playing games. Are we I'm playing Overwatch? I, I, updated it on my playstation so i still have to update it don't look at me like that listen kaylee (laughs) we had this conversation i know i know listen i can update it it'll be fine it'll be fine i'll update it don't do this to me look look i'll (laughs) i'll facetime you i'll facetime you okay okay Okay. all right love ya bye guys bye bye kaylee okay Oh my goodness. All right, let me go ahead and there we go. And end. Easy peasy. See, I wanted to give you guys a little fun introduction with my BFF. Okay, I'm taking off the headphones just because that way. Uh, yeah, we played Overwatch for like two years together, like hardcore. We're like big into all that stuff. Okay, so just so you guys know, this is how tonight's going to work because I wanted an easy way for us to do this. So I am working on the Crescent City Notes. And if you have not... Um, If you have not already downloaded them or if you want to download them, they are linked. Um, So you can just go to my website and download the resources. Right now it is just part one and part two, but the doc, that doc that you have access to will be updated with part three and four when we're done. Um, And you guys have to give massive shout out to Freckles and Fiction, Avery and Samantha, um, who will be on the crossover stream. They really helped with it. Um, But the way tonight is gonna work, just so you guys can see, I'm gonna show you my screen really quick. So this is what the doc looks like. This is the draft version. This is the unofficial version. Um, And you'll notice that we always highlight any important chapters that we feel like you should reference. Pink is any chapter that I personally love. Um, And so tonight we're going to be referencing some of these yellow chapters, but I'm going to quickly go through them uh, just to kind of jog your memory about what happened in each chapter. And then we're going to go back and talk about these yellow highlighted chapters. Um, Okay, so that's what's going to be. I'm not going to really share this screen Um, very much because as you can see Avery's in here right now Um, but you'll just see my face so just so you know that's kind of uh, how it's organized I know look at the look at these notes they're so this is my favorite part is you just like you can click one and it'll like take you right here don't look this is the unedited version that's why you guys can't see this shh Okay, so that's what we're gonna do tonight so I'm gonna move really really fast okay I'm gonna move um super fast through this. So don't feel like uh, if you're like lost, don't worry. Um, And also feel free to put your questions in the, um, you feel free to put your questions in the comments. I'm going to read them slowly. Uh, So don't worry if I miss it. I may come back and like read your comments. So don't worry. Um, Okay. So starting with part three, we're going to go through all of part three and then we'll do part four together. So part three, just to kind of remind you to uh, to go back a little bit where part two ended. So part two ended where we discovered that um, Danica was the one, uh, we discovered that Sabine is the one who uh, she swapped uh, footage um, because there was no footage of Danica there. And we found out that Sabine could be kind of behind this and potentially she's the number one suspect for Danica's death. OK, so uh, basically kind of where we left off. So uh, chapter 38, um, this is just more just kind of discussing uh, Sabine and having, you know, Sabine be a subject uh, suspect. Bryce very quickly is like, I don't think it's Sabine. She's not that type of evil, vindictive person. But, you know, that's kind of how this works. OK, uh, 39 is the Medwitch. This is the first time you meet her at the crime scene. Um, and this is kind of where you start to see that relationship with her and uh, Rune, which is kind of cool. Um, let me go ahead and go at the top. Make it easier for myself. Okay, Uh, 40 is Victoria's finding. So this is when you go back to the uh, committeeum. Is that how you say it? I want to say condominium, but that's not right. The committee. Um, and you find out what uh, Sabi- or what Victoria discovers. Uh, chapter 41 is Jelly Jubilee. So that's when they all go. That's when Bryce and uh, Hunt go down in the sewers. They get really dirty, which sounds dirty, but 
they're in sewers. Uh, then they come up um, and they go back to the apartment. They shower. Uh, Hunt finds the unicorns. And then you get the really cute Shelly Jubilee. We're going to go back to that chapter. Uh, chapter 42 is the Merman chapter. So that is with Therion. So that's kind of when you get to meet Therion for the first time. Chapter 43 is when you go to Moonwood, which is the Wolves' Den. Um, and that is also a very big traumatic chapter. Um, chapter 44 is the rooftop. So this is when you find out that Bryce uh, tried or was going to potentially end her life, which was very sad, but you get a little bit of that backstory. Uh, chapter 45 is when Hunt goes out to drinks with the Triari. Um, chapter 46 is when the Crystal of Steaman attacks Bryce and Hunt. Uh, chapter 47 is when Bryce and Hunt go back to the roof and they have a little bit of like flirty, flirty time and then Sabine interrupts. Um, chapter 48 is when we discover that Danica is the one that stole the horn. Chapter 49 is is um, us discovering that the footage was switched so we can see the switching of the footage. Uh, chapter 50 is a big conversation about the Star Eater and uh, this is a little bit more history around the Starborn Fae and all of that fun stuff. Uh, chapter 51 is the Aedis chapter so we will go back to Aedis. Uh, chapter 52 is when Bryce runs to the um, Autumn King, demands his, um, his uh, uh, appearance, um, but no one kind of comes. Rune kind of comes to the rescue a little bit. Uh, chapter 53 is when Micah summons Hunt to do a job. Uh, chapter 54 is the infamous shower chapter. Um, we I have that highlighted just as like a favorite moment. Uh, chapter 55 is, I called it clothing sale. So that's the chapter where there's a little bit of flirty time in the kitchen, burnt eggs, all that fun stuff. Chapter 56 is the video call with Ember. Um, which is a great chapter. Um, chapter 57 is when we get a little bit of backstory about how Randall and Ember and Bryce all met, or I should say how Randall met Bryce and Ember. Um, we're going to go through that chapter. Uh, chapter 58 is when they go to uh, the meat market and uh, Hunt buys the little opal, the little gem for Bryce. Um, chapter 59 is when we discover that Danica was dealing drugs, but she really wasn't. Um, chapter 60 is Danica's birthday. This is usually when I tell you, you probably shouldn't, this is when you should stop because the train's going. Um, chapter 61 is the chapter where Bryce gets the um, venom out of her leg. It's the really sweet moment where Hunt and Bryce kiss for the first time. Um, chapter 62 is when Hunt's wings get cut off. Uh, chapter 63 is when Bryce discovers the hidden file in Danica's computer. Um, chapter 64 uh, is when we thought we were getting hanky-panky, but we weren't, and then Therion calls. Uh, chapter 65 is Therion taking Bryce to the barge. Chapter 66 is when you discover Hunt's betrayal officially. And chapter 67 is just the aftermath of that experience. Okay, we're going to go back and let's talk about some chapters. So we're going to start with chapter 41. We're going to do 41 through 43 in a row, and then we'll skip to 50. Okay, I'm going to open up this in a second, Doc. So that was my very quick uh, recap when we were discussing favorite moments I complete. Yeah, Danica's birthday. Okay, so going back to chapter 41, the Jelly Jubilee, I just want to kind of bring this up. So number one, uh, br this chapter starts off with Bryce is dragging Strings home because he's raining. He's not happy. Uh, she's dropping him off at home because then she's heading to Fyro to investigate. Uh, after inspecting the gate, because they believe that the gate is somehow connected to the demon, um, they realize that the demon most likely went into the sewers, but they don't find anything that directly connects Sabine and the demon. Hunt calls the Many Waters contact which we later find out is Therion. And then they head home. And as they head home, Bryce is in the shower and Hunt finds Jelly Jubilee. So some important quotes from this chapter. Number one, the Rose Gate. Um, so it says that the Rose Gate had roses, wisteria, and countless other flowers gleamed with rain in the first light from lampposts flanking the traffic circle and beyond. A few cars uh, wound past the disperse uh, either into the city streets or along Central Avenue. Um, in the centuries since the Fae had decided to cover the gate with flowers and climbing plants, the Rose Gate had begun one of the most, the biggest tourist draws with thousands of people flocking there each day to give a drop of power to make a wish on its dial pad, uh, nearly hidden beneath the ivy, um, and to snap photos. So essentially the very, the uh, flowers on this um, specific gate like never really die. So that's kind of just a really cool um, moment uh, about this. Uh, 
Um, so, and then kind of talking a little bit about the Jelly Jubilee, uh, he says, you want to tell me something? And she goes, about what? He goes, what the F is this? She extends a hand, uh, opens up a big fist. There's a purple glittery unicorn inside. She snatched the toy from his hand. Why are you snooping through my things? This is one of the unicorn Pegasus, Jelly Jubilee. And then she's, he asks her, why does she have it? And she says, because it made me happy. It makes me happy. Um, at his still bemused, uh, bemused look, she added, all right, if you want to get deep about it, Athelar, playing with them was the first time the other kids didn't treat me like a total freak. The starlight fancy horses were the number one toy on every girl's winter solstice wish list when I was five, and they were not all made equal. Poor Princess Cream Puff was a common as a hot... A hot a hop toad, but Jelly Jubilee, she smiled at the purple unicorn Pegasus, the memory of it summoned. My mom left Nadaros for the first time in years to buy one from one of the big towns two hours away. She was the ultimate starlight fancy conquest, not just a unicorn, not just a Pegasus, but both. I flashed this baby at school and was instantly accepted. Um, which I think is a really sweet memory. It kind of makes you realize like Bryce really, she probably did struggle growing up. And so it's, it's an important one to kind of bring up. So Okay, moving to chapter 42. Um, this is the Merman chapter. So this is when we meet Therion. So they go to the Istros River um, and they meet Therion Kedos. Uh, Hunt and Therion know each other from a previous case a year ago where his sister was unfortunately murdered. Uh, they give Therion some details about the demon and asks if he knows anything. He says he does it, but he's willing to poke around. And if he sees anything, he's gonna send an otter, which makes Bryce very happy. Uh, Bryce and Hunt then head back to the gallery and they discuss why Bryce keeps Danica's jacket. And then they also discuss Hunt's sunball hat. So to kind of give you some really important quotes, there's a lot of quotes about the many waters and the court. Um, so I'm not going to read them all to you, but they are in the notes. Um, we have some quotes about the blue court, uh, what the mayor are, and you know, kind of how their abilities work in the world of Crescent City. Um, Therion, um, he was a powerful male, uh, body swimming closer to the reddish brown scales of his long tail. Catching the light was a burnish copper. Black stripes slash slashed through them. The pattern continued up the torso like some aquatic tiger. Um, and then he is revealed that he was just promoted to captain of her intelligence. Um, so he's very, you know, highly regarded in the, uh, with the River Queen at the Mini Waters Court. Um, so that is always a big win. Um, and then also they talk a little bit about something called the beneath, um, which I thought was a very cool kind of mythological thing. So uh, some of the darker mare had done that long ago, carried human brides down to the undersea courts and kept them there trapped within the massive air bubbles that contain parts of their palaces, cities, unable to reach the surface. Um, the other thing that's important to note is... Um, with the, I did want to bring up with the blue court, uh, there's only one sub that goes in and out of the court per day. Um, and it only can be traveled by people with an invitation. So not everyone can visit this court, um, which is really interesting because this was the only court that really opened themselves up when the demons started attacking at the very end of the book. So just kind of a really cool um, little thing. Now, I just want to touch on Danica's jacket and hunt sunball hat. So uh, Bryce says that Danica used to store her stuff in the supply closet here rather than bothering to go back to the apartment or cut over at the den. She stashed the jacket here the day um, and she doesn't go on. She goes, I didn't want Sabine to have it. She would have read the back of it and thrown it in the trash. Um, and then Hunt asks why it says through love all is possible. Danica had a thing about the phrase. It was all the Oracle told her apparently, which made no sense because Danica was one of the least lovey-dovey people I'd ever met, but something about it resonated with her. So after she died, I kept the jacket and started wearing it. Then Hunt explains that uh, the hat was the first thing he bought when he came here with his first paycheck he ever received from Micah. I saw it in an athletic shop and it just seemed so ordinary. I had no idea how different Lunathian was from the Eternal City, from anything in Pangira, and the hat was just, it represented that. Yeah, it seems like a new beginning, a step towards a more normal existence. Well, as normal as someone can be like me. So you have your hat and I have Jelly Jubilee, which I think is a, a really sweet moment. So, okay. And then 43, visiting the den in Moonwood. So this is a really heavy chapter about uh, the wolves. And so I'm not going to read all of it, but I do want to talk about the Black Rose Pack and e Ethan. 
Um, so the Black Rose Wolf Pack was three females and one male. All um, they were they appeared to Bryce when she and Hunt went to um, interrogate Sabine um, in their human form. They are uh, all armed with guns and sheathed swords on their backs. The tattoo of an onyx rose with three claw marks slashed through its petals adorn the sides of their necks, marking them as members of their Black Rose Wolf Pack. Though young, the Pack of Devils had been revered in the most talented wolves in generations, led by the most powerful alpha to grace Midgard soil. The Black Rose Pack was a far cry from that. Um, and the haughty arrogance that made Sabine tap her as Alpha. Uh, this is Emil. Uh, I think that's how you say her name. Uh, okay. Uh, and then she over Ethan uh, Holstrom. Now Emil second. But Sabine wanted someone like herself, regardless of Ethan's higher power ranking and perhaps someone a little less Alpha too. So she firmly, uh, so she could then have them firmly under her claws. So just kind of want to say that, like, it's very clear that Sabine did that on purpose. Like, this is a pack that is definitely below Sabine, whereas I feel like Danica's pack maybe might have um, potentially um, rivaled Sabine a little bit. My glasses are dirty, so I'm just cleaning them. Um, and then just some little bit of background on Ethan. So Ethan and Bryce had a very, very close relationship, something I think we will see in Sky and Breath or just in general in the series, or I hope we do. Um, and they called... Uh, Ethan Connor shadow. Um, he dropped out of CCU after Connor had died, quit playing Sunball. Um, she only knew because they caught a game on TV one night, two months later, and the commenters were still discussing it. No one, not his coaches, not his friends or his pack mates could convince him to return. He walked away from the sport and never looked back. Um, there was about 21 ignored calls from Ethan the first few days following the murder and about a half a dozen audio mails. The first had been sobbing and panicked, left hours afterwards, and then the messages shifted to worry. And then uh, and then by the end, the last audio mail from Ethan uh, was nothing but razor sharp coldness. Um, and then the last message she got from Ethan said, the Legion inspector showed me all the messages. Connor practically told you he loved you and you finally agreed to go out with him. Then you F some stranger in the Raven Raven bathroom while he was dying. Are you kidding me with this shit? Don't come to the sailing tomorrow. You're not welcome here. But she never wrote him back after that. So that is just some stuff about Ethan. Um, okay. How are we doing? Those are the first three. And then we're going to talk about the Star Eater and then Adis. Any, any quick questions coming up? Anything major? Anything? Are we good? This hurts my heart. Well, now I need a sunball hat, right? Right? That's how I feel. Okay. Um, all right, then I'm going to go ahead and move on to the Star Eater chapter, which is chapter 50. So there is a lot of stuff in this chapter. This is definitely one that you are going to want to go back and read. Um, but it is essentially so Bryce is reeling from the bombshell that Sabine dropped and Hunt tries to give her space. Rune stops by the library to update a theory about a new drug with synthetic magic to possibly heal the horn. Rune reveals that the Star Sword needs a long bladed knife to have the power. The knife was lost. Um... And then on Otter Mail is delivered from Therion, realize that Danica and the pack may have not been killed by the Crystal Love Steven. So some important things to kind of note here is the knife and the sword. So this is something that Rune talks about. He said the sword was part of a pair. A long bladed knife was forged uh, from the Arinia mind from the same meteorite which fell from our old world. But the world of the Fae had left to travel through the Northern Rift and into Midgard. But we lost the knife eons ago. Even the Fae archives have no record of how it might have been lost. But it seems to have been sometime during the First Wars. It's another of the Fae's countless insane prophecies, Bryce muttered, when the knife and sword are reunited, so shall our people be. It's literally carved above the Fey Archives entrance, whatever that means, Rune said. Um, and then the next thing is asking about, have you ever visited the Fey Archives in Avalon? I heard they're grander than what's brought over here. She being Lahaba, uh, twirled her, um, her curl of flame around her finger. No, Rune said, but the Fey on that misty island are even less welcoming than the ones here. I'm really hoping we see the Avalon Fey in Sky and Breath because... I just think that they are the key to some stuff. 
Okay. Uh, and then the last thing that I kind of want to highlight is Bryce is talking about the last Starborn Fae. So Bryce said that he was alive when the Starborn Prince appeared. You know, you ever ask what happened to him? Why he died before he made the drop? And Rune Pale, don't be stupid. That was an accident during his ordeal. Hunt kept his face neutral, but Bryce leaned in her chair and said, if you say so. So Bryce is implying here that her father had something to do with the last Starborn Fae's death. Um, but it is obviously not clear. There's a lot of information, you know, kind of miss lead um so this is a chapter i would definitely kind of peruse and check over it's chapter 50 uh because this is an important one uh we're going to see the knife again i'm sure of it i agree i think we are going to see the knife again okay chapter 51 let's talk about atis atis everyone's favorite thing now before i talk about the atis chapter let me just go ahead and say i do not think atis is a love interest i don't I don't think he's a love interest. I don't think he has anything to do with being a love interest with Bryce. I think Adis is, um, I think he's like, I kind of view him as like a mentorship relationship, but like, obviously he's a little closer. I mean, he's not closer in age, but he looks closer in age. So it could be a romantic relationship, but it doesn't feel romantic to me. So just want to put that out there before I start this chapter, because I know some people think he's a romantic interest and... I personally don't. So, okay. Uh, Bryce and Hunt, or I should say Bryce, summons Adis. Adis wants to know why Hunt, uh, who Hunt is. He's a very much curious about that. Uh, and then Adis says, run the test again. Find out what's in, in between. Um, then Bryce finds out that Declan has something that could be used, uh, that could have been used two years prior. Uh, but it's Faytech and the Autumn King didn't give permission. So this is why Bryce leaves the apartment to just go yell at the Autumn King. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit about Adis and Hell. So Adis, when he has arrived, Hunt always imagined the Prince of Chasm as similar to a lower level demon he hunted over the centuries. Scales or fangs or claws, brute muscle and snarling with blind animal rage, not this slender, pale-skinned pretty boy. Adis's blonde hair fell from fell to his shoulders with soft waves, loose yet well cut around his fine boned face, undoubtedly to show off the, his eyes like blue opals framed with, by thick golden lashes. Those lashes bobbed once in a curious blink. Then his full sens uh, sensuous mouth parted in a smile to reveal a row of two white teeth. Bryce Quinlan. Hunt's hand drifted to the gun. The prince of the chasm knew her name, her face, and the way he spoke her name was as much of a greeting as it was a question, and his voice was velvet soft. Adis occupied the fifth level of hell, the chasm. He yielded only to two others, the Prince of the Abyss and the Prince of the Pit, the seventh and the mightiest of demon princes, the star eater himself, whose name was never uttered on this side of the Northern Rift. No one would dare say his name, not after the Prince of the Pit became the first and only to ever kill an Asteri. His butchering of the seventh holy star, Sirius, the wolf star, during the first wars remained a favorite ballad around war campfires. And what he'd done to Sirius after slaying her had earned him that awful title star eater but Adis smiled looking over hunt again a fallen warrior with the power of and Adis groomed brows lifted in surprise his blue opal eyes narrowed to slits then sl simmered like the hottest flame what are you doing with a black crown around your brow hunt didn't dare let his surprise at the question show he never heard it called that before a black crown halo witch ink mark of shame but never that Adis looked between them now carefully he didn't bother to let hunt answer his question before the awful smile returned the seven princes dwell in darkness and do not stir we have no interest in your realm uh Adis then sucked in a breath uh as if tasting the air in which hunt's words had been delivered to him you do realize that uh it might not be my people the northern rift opens to other places other realms yes but other planets as well what is hell but a distant planet bound to yours by a ripple of space and time hell is a planet hunt's brows lowered most of the demons he killed dealt with hadn't been able hadn't been able to or inclined to speak but ada shrugged with one shoulder it's as real as a place as midgard though most of us would have you believe it wasn't the prince pointed to him your kind fallen were made in midgard by the asteri but the fey the shifters and others came from their own worlds the universe is massive some believe it has no end or that our universe might be a multitude with bountiful as the stars in the sky or sand on a beach 
Horrorfrost crept across the floors. You're not rattling the Northern Rift. The lesser princes do that. Level ones through four, Ada said. Those of us in the true dark have no need or interest in sunshine, but they do uh, did not send the Crystalos. Our plans do not involve such things. Hunt growled. What kind, what, your kind wanted to live here once upon a time. Why would that change? Um, so basically there's lots of really interesting information about hell. It's viewed as a planet. I'm going to be honest. It's also potentially maybe a certain portal that Aelin opens in, you know, crown of midnight, but it's fine. Um, anyways, so, uh, the Prince of the Cat. So it's just a very, I do think at some point we're going to go to hell. I just do. It sounds like it's a planet. It sounds like an important place. So, uh, just throwing that out there. Um, Okay. Then the final thing that he says right before he leaves is he says, make the drop Bryce Quinlan uh, and find me when you're done. Uh, Adis had nearly vanished into nothing, but he added the words as ghost, a slithering through the room. The Oracle did not see, but I did. So just saying, I'm just saying. Okay. So that is just some really interesting stuff about Adis, which I know is obviously a big one for you guys. Um, now we're going to go ahead and skip to the right after the phone call with uh, Ember and right after the phone call with Ember and um, Randall. Why was I blanking on Randall's name? Ember and Randall. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, basically Bryce gives a little bit of backstory. So Bryce explains that my mom ran from my biological father before he found out he was pregnant. Hi, Avery. I see you in the dock right here. <laughs> Uh, she wound up a temple in, uh, Clotho in, to Cl- Clothona. I really hate these words. Clotho is from Akatar, not Clothona. Clotho, Clothona? Whatever. Uh, and knew the priestesses would take her in, shield her, since she was... <laughs> Holy pregnant vessel or whatever Bryce snorted. She gave birth to me there and I spent the first three years of my life cloistered behind the temple walls. My mom did their laundry to earn our keep. Long story short, my biological father heard a rumor that she had a child and sent goons to hunt her down. She ground her teeth. He told them that if there was a child that was undoubtedly his, they were to bring uh, me to him at any cost. Uh, they had eyes on every depot, but the priests uh, priestesses got us out of the city with the hope of getting us all the way to House of Earth and Blood headquarters in Helene, where my mom could beg for asylum even my father wouldn't dare infringe on their territory but it's a three-day drive are you putting a pronunciation for me (laughs) she is (laughs) just so you guys can see this (laughs) kathona thank you (laughs) thank you um Okay, so uh, we drove five hours to Solus' temple, uh, partially to rest, but also to pick up the Holy Guard. Uh, And then he asks if Randall was a sun priest. Not quite. He'd gotten back from uh, the front a year before, but the stuff did... uh, and saw while he was serving, it messed with him really badly. He didn't want to go home, couldn't face his family. So he'd offered himself as an acolyte to Solus, hoping that uh, it somehow atoned for his past. He was two weeks away from swearing his vows when the high priest asked him to escort us to Helene. Many of the priests are trained warriors, uh... But Randall was the only human. The high priest guessed my mother wouldn't trust a veneer male. Uh, right before we reached Helene, my father's people caught up with us, uh... They expected to find a helpless, hysterical female. Bryce smiled again. But what they found was a legendary sharpshooter and a mother who would move the earth itself to keep her daughter. So just some fun little uh, information there, which I think is always important to have. Um, Okay, let's move on to chapter 61. Chapter 61. So this is the... Very beautiful chapter with Hunt and Bryce. This is when they have their kiss. This is when the med witch, Hypexia, uh, takes the stuff out of Bryce's leg. Um, gonna read a few things. So number one, they talk a little bit about the witches in Pangira. Um, the witches in Pangira were a, f- a far cry from the wood paneled shop Hunt had visited in Pangira, where witches still made their own potions and iron cauldrons that had been passed down through generations. Uh, there's also a comment about Bryce's tattoo, but the most interesting one is the conversation around uh, Hunt's tattoo. So 
Uh, the witch asked, does the, ta- does the halo hurt you? Only when it went on. Uh, what w- witch inked it? Some imperial hag, Hunt said through his teeth, one of the old ones. The witch's face tightened. Uh, it's a dark asp- darker aspect of our work that we bind individuals through a halo. It should be halted entirely. He threw her a half smile, but it didn't reach his eyes. Want to take it off from me? The witch went wholly still, and Bryce's breath ca- caught in her throat. What would you do if I did? The witch asked softly. Her dark eyes glimmered with interest and ancient power. Would you punish those who you... who? have held you captive. Bryce opened her mouth to warn them that this is a dangerous conversation, but Hunt thankfully said, I'm not here to talk about my tattoo. It lay in his eyes, though, his answer, the confirmation. Yes, he'd kill the people who'd done this. And the witch inclined her head slightly as if she saw the answer. So, uh, (laughs) the lag on this is wild. I know. I know. Thank you, YouTube, for that. I know. So if it seems like I'm ignoring your comments, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> um, okay. This is something that's very interesting. My Throne of Glass friends who have finished Throne of Glass, I don't know if you have you might recognize this because um, this may sound similar to something else in that series. So when they take the venom out of Bryce's leg, um, it says, like a switch had been flipped, the pain was gone. It was starting enough that Bryce turned away from Hunt and peered at the body. The blood and the on it the gaping wound she might have fainted at the sight of the good six inches in her leg opening um the witch held it was a set of pinchers and it as if it were indeed a worm and if my magic was a stabilizing the venom like it would be liquid uh she carefully removed the venom a clear uh wiggling worm with black flecks towards the glass jar it withered like a living thing the witch deposited it in a jar and shut the lid magic humming um the poison instantly dissolved into a puddle but still vibrated as if looking for a way out that may sound familiar to you. Just throwing that out there. Just throwing that out there. Okay, uh, let's go to 63 now. So this is when Bryce finds the... Uh, 63 is the file. Um, so I'm just going to read a few things from this. I'm pulling up my Kindle edition. Okay. So... This is when Bryce finally, she, uh, she's trying to figure out, uh, Danica's password. Um, when she finally, she notices that there's a folder called party invites. Um, and when she looks at it, she notices that it is an, uh, there's three unmarked videos in it. So that is kind of what, um, is in the video. Keep in mind at this point, uh, Hunt's wings are no longer attached to his body anymore. Um, So when Bryce comes back to uh, the apartment in chapter 64, uh, they show the footage. It says the bottom of the video, the ticker read artificial amplification for power dysfunction test subject seven. There was a human female in a med gown. Uh, Hunt is confused because Hunt is seeing it. These were synth research trials. A young Drakiri male in a lab coat entered the room bearing a tray of supplies. The video sped up as if someone had increased the speed of the footage for the sake of urgency. The male then took vitals and injected her something in her arm, in her arm the human's arm, and left the room. Um, the camera kept rolling after five minutes, 10 minutes, two veneer walked into the room, two large serpentine shifters who sized up the human female locked alone with them. Hunt's stomach turned and turned further at the slave tattoos on their arms and knew that they were prisoners, knew from the way that they smiled at the female shrinking against the wall, why they had been locked up. They lunged for her, but the human female did too. It happened so fast that Hunt could barely track it. The person who edited the food. Uh, footage went back and slowed it too. He watched blow by blow as the human female launched herself at the two veneer males and then ripped them to pieces. And then, uh, and then it says Therion had said that the synth could temporarily grant humans powers greater than most veneer powers enough to kill. Um, and then Hunt realizes this is why the human rebels want this. Then they send in two more males bigger than the last, but they also end up in pieces Then they send in another two, then three, then five. The entire room was red until the veneer were uh, clawing at the doors, begging to be let out, begging as their companions, then led by themselves, were slaughtered. The human female was screaming, her head tilted to the uh, ceiling. Um, Then she turned on herself and ripped herself up. So this is the footage that Bryce sees. And the reason I feel like it's important to kind of 
discuss is because I do think this is going to come up again. I think this this isn't the last we've seen of synth. And these are obviously what would happen if it was injected to someone um, who was human. Um, so there was other videos that were similar and Danica had clearly left this footage for Bryce to find. Um, and so it, it's a little bit scary, which is obviously what then leads Hunt to try and stop the deal on the barge, but it's a little too late. He's already been set up for it. So that is just kind of a really important little thing to bring up that I wanted to make sure you guys, we talked about. Um, and then let's talk about chapter 66. So this is Hunt's big betrayal. Um, I'm not going to go through as I'm going to try and avoid as much pain as I can, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, what uh, what their goal was, because I, I didn't fully understand this the first time I read it. So I, if for anyone else who this is the second read, for, read through for them, I just wanted to kind of repeat it. So Micah says these three, he's talking about Hunt, Victoria and Justinian. Um learned of the Sith days ago and have been at and have since been seeking a way to purchase it and distribute it among their fellow would be rebels to attain its powers long enough to break their halos and finish what Shahar started on Mount Hermon. He nodded towards the Viper Queen. She was gracious enough to inform me of this plan after Justinian tried to recruit a female under her influence. Um, and then Hunt says that Micah assigned me some targets, three drug lords. They told me that two years ago, a small amount of synth leaked from Render Lab onto the streets, but it ran out fast and too fast. They said that finally, after two years of trying to replicate it, someone had figured out the formula at last, and now it was being made and would be capable of amping up our power. I didn't think it had anything to do with the case, not until recently. I didn't know the truth of what the hell it could even do until I saw the footage of the trials. So then they ask, how did it leak? Micah says Danica leaked it. Danica sold it, Bryce, which we all know this isn't true in the end. Um, and they they basically try to sell Bryce that Danica was addicted to this stuff. Um, so it's and then they also blame the CCU students that died that night on Danica at that time. Um they, they try to make it seem like Danica was waiting to do the drop for Bryce. You know, they, they, it's essentially just like all of that. Um, it says a side effect of the synth when used in high doses, the surge of powerful magic grants the user also the ability to open portals. Thanks to the obsidian salt in the formula, Danica did just that, accidentally summoning the crystalos. The black salt in the synth can have a mind of its own uh, sentience. Its measurement in the synth formula matches the unholy number in the crystalos. With a high dose of synth, the power of the salt gains control and can summon the crystalos. That's why we've been seeing them recently. The drug is on the streets now. Um, and in doses higher than what is recommended, like you suspected, the chrysalis feeds on vital organs, using the sewers to deposit bodies into the waterway. The two most recent victims, an acolyte and a temple guard, were unfortunate victims of someone high on Sith. So, obviously, we know that this is not true, that Micah was the one that was doing this, but that's basically what's going on. So, that is part three. Is there anything else that y'all want to go over in part three? Um, I'm going to, you're going to see this delay because I'm going to, I'll wait for y'all comments, um, as we go through. Okay. I'm going to read some stuff. Uh, I had to put the book down for like 10 minutes after that scene. I was yelling S Sarah J Mass, you better fix this, bro. I got my day last wrong. I just realized I'm missing this live. I'm glad I made it before it ends. Nope. Yep. You're good. Uh, when she throws the opal at him, my heart broke. Yeah, seriously. This is where Hunt lost me. <laughs> it's such a common plot just in books that I did not see it coming. It's so true. I didn't see it coming either. Um, one of my tab colors was literally just labeled emotional damage. And there was an uncomfortable amount of those tabs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is uh this is a really wild part of the story. Um, and it's a really tragic part. I feel like, um, is all of this crazy, uh, stuff. And I feel like, um, for me personally, I'll tell you when I read it, it wasn't the barge that upset me. It was actually, when we get to part four, it was finding out Hunt was sold to Sandriel. I lost it. I was like, not okay with it. I started making Empire of Storms references about a certain thing that happens to a certain character in that series, on in that book. Um, because I was like, I can't go through that emotional tor turmoil again. Um, thrilled to say that that didn't happen. <laughs> um, and it was just, it was really hard. So uh, 
I know for some people it is definitely kind of this this section that is the most challenging um but for me it was definitely the latter i think the the um the later information about hunt and what his punishment was was just the worst it was the worst so okay well i don't see any major questions so i'm gonna go ahead and start part four we have a lot of stuff we're gonna go over uh so everyone ready to kind of discuss part four are you guys ready Are you guys ready for the part four madness? Giving him back to Sandriel, right? Uh, when Bryce, oh, we're gonna talk about that. I didn't think he would get out in, I didn't either. Uh, I'm not done with my tandem brain. Honestly, the worst part, even though she was so upset, she could still stomach allowing that to happen to him. I know, I know, I know. Okay, you guys ready to do part four? Okay, I'm gonna do the quick recap again, and then we will, uh, here we go. I'm going to do the re quick recap and then we're going to hold on. There we go. Um, and then we're going to go through the chapter selection. So uh, we're going to come back to the first chapter, chapter 68. This is when we discovered that Hunt was purchased by or sold, gifted. I think gifted. I don't think she actually bought him to Sandriel. Uh, but then there's also some really interesting stuff with the Autumn King, which is why we're going to go back to that chapter. Uh, chapter 69 is the camera roll. So this is when uh, they go through all of the photos on Hunt's uh, phone. We're not going through that. Uh, chapter 70 is when Fury goes to Bryce's apartment and tells Bryce what happened to Hunt. Um, and then she says, don't do something stupid. Chapter 71 is my personal favorite. This is when Rune comes to the rescue. We are going to go through that because it's my favorite. Uh, chapter 72 is when Bryce is attacked by the Chrysalis demon. Chapter 73 was the start of the summit, uh, which is a great chapter just to kind of check out with for the Asteri. We're not going to talk about that tonight, but it will be in the notes. So I'll highlight it in the notes for you guys to kind of reference that. Uh, chapter 74 is between Bryce, Lahaba, and Shrinks in the gallery. They're all watching the um, summit and they're just saying how they want life to get back to normal. Uh, chapter 75 is a great chapter where you get to see uh, Hypexia, Queen Hypexia, and um, Therion kind of get to are kind of um team up a little bit against sandriel to fight for some rights for the uh house of many waters um which i kind of forgot that chapter completely we're gonna go through 76 through 78 this is when micah goes to um the gallery and it's the big kind of evil villain speech it's another one of my favorites um so we're gonna do 76 that's that 77 is when we discover that bryce is the horn and 78 is uh some great little easter eggs for anyone who's read throne of glass and akatar uh 79 is lahaba's sacrifice 80 is Memento Mori. That is when Bryce uses the gun um, to shoot Micah in the face. Uh, 81 is when Bryce then vacuums it up. Uh, 82 is us discovering that the horn was a success and hell has officially been unleashed on Lunathian. 83 is when Bryce uh, goes outside and discovers that the only section that is not being protected is the human section, so she runs to the meadows. 84 is when... Um, Hunt calls the Viper Queen and says that he owes she owes him a favor. Uh, 85 is when Bryce um, finally reunites with Ethan. They have a really sweet moment. And then Bryce sacrifices herself to make sure uh, Ethan gets into one of the final, um, like, holding... Uh, what am I blanking on the word? You know what I'm talking about. Anyways, uh, 86 is the final call. This is when Bryce calls uh, Hunt and he answers. And then she gives kind of her little go goodbyes. We're going to go through that. Um... 87 is when we discover that Bryce is the actual true Starborn Fae. 88 is um, when Hypexia takes the crown off of Hunt. And then 89 is when Hunt kills Sandriel. 90 is when uh, they get in the helicopter and they head to Lunathian. Uh, 91 is when uh, Bryce uh, discovers that Hunt sacrificed himself to save her. And she tries to, she goes up to the dial to see if someone can help her make the drop. And Danica responds. Um... 92 is when Bryce does the drop with Danica. 93 is um, when Danica and Bryce have a little bit of a moment while they are down um, in the drop. Uh, 
94 is when Bryce comes back to hunt. 95 is everyone's back at home. They're about to get some hanky panky on, but instead Bryce's mom calls. Uh, 96 is when the Asteri call and take the slave mark off of, they give, they give him a free mark on hunt. Uh, 97 is when she texts uh, Connor officially and says that she's home and it's the final chapter. And then we will go through the epilogue, which is with Adis. Okay, let's go back. So we're going to talk about 68. We're going to go through 71, 76 through 78, 83 and 84, 86 through 89, 92, 92 and 93, 95 and 96, and then the epilogue. So that's kind of our rattle off. Um, oh, I just realized uh, one of my mods or someone in the court, if you could do me a favor, I know we're like, an hour into the live stream at this point. When I start rattling off these chapters, can you mark the time uh, on the YouTube so that um, I'm going to try and put some timestamps in here? Just if one of you can do that so I can come back and put some timestamps. Okay. Um, I'm sure someone will. They'll see my <laughs> thing in a minute. Okay. Let's go through uh, 89 or 68. So 68 is uh, where we discover that he's been sold um, to Sandriel. Sandriel comes and kind of is a jerk. Um, but the thing I want to go through is uh, the conversation between the Autumn King and Bryce, because I, I, this is the first time I kind of, I, first off, I felt like this was a fever dream because I could never remember where this was in the book. I was like, didn't she have a conversation with the Autumn King? And he like revealed that he loved her like mother the entire time. And I realized the reason I never knew where it was was because the start of this chapter was so traumatizing. I usually just skip the whole chapter. So it wasn't until this reread that I was like, oh, it's been hidden behind this chapter this entire time. Like I'm an idiot. You know what I mean? Like I just, so I want to go through this because I feel like this is a really interesting conversation and could potentially come up in Sky and Breath. Um, so the, so he comes, uh, the Autumn King comes to the gallery and uh, he says that Rune told him what happened on the river. Um, and he says, I've come to tell you that your security has been assured and that the governor knows you were innocent in the matter and will not dare to harm you, even to punish Athalar. Uh, her father stilled. You're incredibly foolish if you think that would be enough to break Athalar at last. Um, she tells him that she doesn't want to talk about this. Um, and he and so she kind of gives a little bit of backstory then she says he says you will talk about this i'm your king and she goes you're not my king legally i am her father said you are listed as a half-faced citizen that places you under my jurisdiction both in this city and as a member of house and sky and breath she goes what is it you want to talk about he goes have you stopped looking for the horn she said does it matter it's a deadly artifact just because you learn the truth regarding danica and athalar doesn't mean whoever wishes it wishes to use it is done um she then tells him that Danica stole the horn, um, ditched it somewhere during one of her flying high, uh, high as a kite moments. It was a dead end. Um, the Crystalos were all exact accidentally summoned by Danica and the others who took the sin thanks to the Black Sultanate. We were wrong even looking for the horn. There was no one, there was no pursuing it. Um, even if no enemy seeks it, it's worth assuring that the horn does not fall into the wrong hands. So these are just kind of important things to think about knowing that, you know, a certain someone is the horn now. Just throwing that out there. Um, he then says, uh, even if the horn is long de uh, defunct, it still holds a special place in Fae history. It will mean all a great deal to my people if it is recovered. I think with your professional expertise, such a search would be of interest to you and your employer. Then he warps the audio feed and he says, I loved your mother very much, you know. And she said, yeah, so much you left a scar on your face. I do not think I uh, do not think I haven't spent every moment since then regretting my actions living in shame. And then he says, you are so much like her more than you know. She never forgave anyone for anything. He said, I would have made her my queen. I had the paperwork all paperwork ready. How surprisingly unelitist of you, she says. Uh, her mother never suggested it, never even hinted at it. She would have hated being queen. She would have said no. She loved me enough to say yes. Absolute certainty laced his words. You think it somehow erases what you did? No, nothing shall erase whatever I did. 
And she said, why did you come here after all these years? He said, I came here after all these years to tell you that you may be like your mother, but you are more like me than you realize. And that's not a good thing. And I just think that this is like an important moment. I just have this like weird inkling that it's important. So I wanted to make sure we went over that because I feel like it, it's telling in my opinion. Um, okay. I'm going to go over chapter 71 because it's my favorite. Sorry. I'm, I'm, it's my favorite. So chapter 71 is when Bryce comes to save Hunt, but this is my favorite because Rune comes in and then everyone finds out that she's the Autumn uh, King's daughter. And look, y'all know I love a strong female lead. I mean, I love Aelin. I love Aelin. I love Feyre. I love Bryce. I love them all. But I also love a moment when the guy comes in to save the day and Rune coming in to save the day. <laughs> I think I reread this more than any moment in the entire book. I probably have that page like it just flips right to it. It just flips right to it because I've read it so many times. So I'm just going to read it again because it's my favorite. Uh, it says, please don't take him. Sandriel's not amused. He's been gifted to me. The papers were signed yesterday. Then let me buy him from you. There was utter silence. Sandriel laughed, the sound rich and uh, litting. Uh, do you know how much I will pay you? 97 million gold marks. The floor rocked beneath hunt people. Gas Pollux blinked, eyeing Bryce again. Bryce extended a piece of paper towards Sandriel, though the Malik, uh, Malachi didn't take it. Even from a few feet behind the Archangel, Hunt's sharp eyesight could make out the writing proof of fun a check from the bank made out to Sandriel for nearly a hundred million marks. A check from Jezeba Roga. Horror sliced through him. How many years had Bryce added to her debt? 12 million more than his asking price when you sold him, right? You'll, I know how to do mathematics. Bryce remained with her arm outstretched, hope in her beautiful face. Here to sweeten the deal and our uh, Tizian amulet. It's 15,000 years old and fetches around 3 million gold marks on the market. That tiny necklace was worth 3 million gold marks. Um, says, uh, then Sandriel glances between him, reading everything on Hunt's face. A snake smile curled in her mouth. Your loyalty to my sister was the one good thing about you, Athalar. She clenched her fist around the amulet, but it seems those photographs did not lie. The amulet melted into a stream on the floor. Something ruptured in hearts in Hunt's chest at the devastation that crumpled Bryce's face. Get out of here, Bryce. His first words all day. But Bryce pocketed the check and slid to her knees. Then take me. Terror rocked through him so violently. He had no words when Bryce looked up at Sandriel. Tears filling her eyes as she said, take my place. Don't you dare. Ah! Um, the male bellowed a crack across the space. Then Rune was there, wreathed in shadows, Declan and Flynn flanking him. They weren't foolish enough to reach for their guns as they sized up Sandriel's guards, realized that Pollux, the malice, stood there sword angled to punch through bryce's chest of sandriel so much as gave a nod the crown prince of the fae pointed at bryce get off the floor but bryce didn't move and just repeated take me instead hunt snapped to be quiet as rune snarled don't listen to a word she says you offer your life, Sandriel said to Bryce, under no coercion, no force. Hunt, uh, Rune lunged forward, shadows unfurling around him, but Sandriel raised a hand and a wall of wind held him in check. He, it choked off the prince's shadows, shredding them into nothing. It held Hunt in check too. Yes, in exchange for Hunt's freedom, I offer myself in my place. Everyone here would call me a fool to take this bargain, Sandriel mused, a half-breed with no true power or hope to come into it. In exchange for freedom of one of the most powerful Malachim to ever darken the skies, the only only warrior in Midgard who can wield lightning. Sandriel, please. But I know your secret, Bryce Quinlan. I know what a prize you are. Rune cut in. That's enough. Sandriel stroked Bryce's face again. The only daughter of the Autumn King. Hunt's knees wobbled. Holy I'm not going to curse because it's YouTube. Tristan <laughs> uh, Flynn breathed. Declan had gone pale as death. Yes, what a prize you would be to possess. Uh, what does your father think that his bastard dar borrowing such a vast amount? Okay, whatever. Uh, and then Rune says, she's a female member of the Fey Royal household and full civitas of the Republic. I lay claim to her as my sister and kin. Ancient worlds, words from laws that had never been changed through... Uh, public sentiment had. Bryce whirled on him. You have no right. Based upon the laws of the Fae as approved by the Asteri ring charged on, she is my property, my father's, and I do not permit her to trade herself for Athalar. Uh, you are a Fae female of my bloodline, Rune said coldly. You are my property and our father's until you marry. Oh, I love Rune. <laughs> Saving the day. Saving the day. Oh, it's so good. Okay. So uh, then she gets really mad. And then Flynn looks at Rune and he says, 
what WTF rune? Why didn't you tell us? Your sister rune? She's our princess. She's not rune growled. The Autumn King has not recognized her, nor will he ever. Why? Because she's his bastard daughter? Because he doesn't like her? I don't know. Rune spat. Rune spat. Um, and he would never reveal his motivations. All I know is I was given an order to never reveal it, even from you. You think we would have told anyone? No, but I couldn't take the risk of him finding out. And even she didn't want anyone to know. Um, and then Bryce goes to the river. And the only thing I'm going to read is just the really funny line about, uh, what are you doing standing in the black dock after sundown? I was kneeling. Same question. I needed a breather. Flynn muttered something. What? I've said I'd known you're a princess for all of an hour and you've already been a pain in my ass. I'm not a princess, she said at the same moment Rune snapped. She's not a princess. Declan snorted. Whatever, assholes. We should have realized you're the only one who even comes close to getting under Rune's skin as easily as his father does. I love this moment. I know I should be on Team Angel with Crescent City, but I'm not. I'm on Team Faye. I'm on Team Rune. I'm on Rune and the crew. That's like my, that's my team. Rune and the crew. And Rune and the crew is my all-time favorite. Rune and the crew. Rune and the crew. It's... <sighs> I can't wait for Sky and Breath. Because Sky and Breath, if you guys don't know this, Sky and Breath is the Fae household as it's been described. So I think we're going to get a lot of Fae in this book. And I'm very excited because I love the Fae. So I just want to... I just want to put that out there that I'm a big fan of this moment in this book. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm done fangirling. That was my favorite moment. Let's talk about the uh, 76 through 78. So we're going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, I do want to say, just to kind of uh, bring this back, um, I would say if you are doing your reread, I'd pay a little bit closer attention to 73 and 75. Um, 73 is the start of the summit. It's a really interesting chapter with the Asteri, and you kind of see how uh, powerful they are for everyone else. So I think that's a really important chapter. And then 75 is a very interesting chapter with Hypexia and Therion and Rune and kind of seeing that potential dynamic that I do think will play out in um, the rest of the series. So, okay, let's go to... Uh, all right, so 76 through 78. So 76, this is when uh, Micah shows up. So, and she calls Jezeba. Um, and let's see, let's see, let's see. So this is, I first off, can I just say, I thought this was such a cool moment in this book and it was done so well. I felt like this was very Hunger Games because everyone's watching from these TV monitors and it's stated multiple times in this book how like how long it would take anyone to get back to the city and like it, it's not possible for anyone to get back to the city in like a reasonable time. And so everyone is just kind of stuck watching and I just thought it was such a really cool visual um, and it oh it's so it's so good. So um, anyways when um this is definitely something I've reread multiple times and I feel like it's a really kind of important thing. So uh, immediately when they see Micah, Tristan calls uh, the ox and says that they need to get over to Griffin Antiqu Antiquities. Uh, but it's obviously there's a bit of a delay. Uh, Micah's kind of... Um, He's kind of toying with Bryce a little bit. He's down in the library, which he's not supposed to be, but he obviously knew that it was there. Uh, so it says, um, he's, she, where is the little, blah, 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 I only left a few behind, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So Bryce let Micah's insult settle, survey, uh, surveying the platter of cheese and grapes she was assembling. Who knows what the truth is? The philosophers in this library certainly had opinions on the matter. On Danica, don't play stupid, Micah said. Do you know what harboring these volumes earns a one-way ticket to execution? Seems a lot of fuss over these books. Humans died for these books, Micah purred, motioning to the shelves towering over them. Banned titles, if I'm not mistaken, many of them supposed to only exist in the Asteri archives. Evolution, mathematics, theories to disprove the superiority of the veneer and Asteri. Some uh, from philosophers people claimed existed before the Asteri arrived. Liars and heretics who admitted they were wrong when the Asteri tortured them for the truth. They were burned alive uh, with the works used as kindling, yet here they are survived. All the knowledge of the ancient world, of a world before the Asteri, and theories of a world in which the veneer are not your masters. 
Uh, what exactly is the library, Rune said to Jessica. But Micah went on, un uh, unwittingly answering the prince's question. Do you even know what you're surrounded by, Bryce Quinlan? This is the great library of Parthos. Bryce, to her credit, said, sounds like a lot of conspiracy crap. Parthos is a bedtime story for humans. Michael chuckled, said the female with the artisan amulet around her neck, an amulet of the priestesses who once served and guarded Parthos. I think you know what's here and what you spend your day amidst, uh, of all the remnants of a library uh, burned to the veneer hands 15,000 years ago. He goes on to say, did you know that the first wars when the Assyri gave the order, it was Parthos that doomed human army made its final stand against the veneer to save proof of what uh, they were before the rifts open to save the books. Hundreds of thousands of humans marched uh, that day, knowing they would die and lose the war to all to buy the priestesses time to grab the most vital volumes. They loaded them onto the ships and vanished. I'm curious to learn how they landed with Jezeb Aroga. So this is, this is a really kind of intense moment. Um, and I think it is something that could potentially be brought up again, because obviously at the end of the book, we know that the library was moved. Um, so it's kind of an intense thing. Um, there's also a bit of a question about, is this why she joined the under King? You know, these are some questions we have. Uh, Micah then says, I've long suspected that the remains of Parthos were housed here. A record of 2000 years of human knowledge before the Asteri arrived. I looked over some of the titles on the shelves and knew it to be true. Um, and then he says that he wants to talk about the horn. So then this is when Micah figures out the same. Basically, it's it's revealed that Micah and Bryce may have figured out at the same moment what happened to the horn. But the thing that Micah has not pieced together, which is cool, I can say, because we've all finished the book here, is the re, the re, I mean, Micah believes that Danica put the horn inside Bryce because um, he felt that she might have a little bit of starborn in her and with the synth, she could probably use the horn. What Micah doesn't realize is the real reason Bryce put the horn on, or Danica put the horn on Bryce's back is because Danica knew all along that Bryce was the true starborn fae. And so she knew that the horn would work for Bryce more than it would work for Rune. So Danica really did it because she was like, she has no true power except for the starboard power, which is more of a, um, I will, we'll talk a little bit about that passage that Ember explains. Um, and that's kind of the real reason. So when you go back and read this, it's very interesting to realize like Danica was very much ahead of the game farther than Micah even realized, um, which is kind of crazy. Um, so, he asks about uh, where the horn is. Uh, he says, I saw the footage of you at the Comidium lobby. You gave the amulet to Sandra and she destroyed it. Uh, that's when I realized the truth too. Bryce says she doesn't know what you were talking about. Uh, Danica knew, knew that without ambition, you would have never have left this job. Never take off the amulet. Explains why within an hour of you taking off the amulet, the demon attacked you. Um... He said, you became the bearer of the night. Danica grounded it into a fine powder, mixed it in witch ink, then got you so drunk you didn't ask questions when she had it tattooed on your back. What? Fury barked. Holy gods. Hunt bared his teeth, still forbidden from speaking because Sandriel has put magic on him. Uh, the tattoo is a language beyond that of this world. It is the language of universes. Who else has a tattoo that has language of universes? You know? I could name two other females, potentially a third. That's not Bryce. Um, and the spells out a direct command to activate the horn with the blast of power, just as it once did for the starborn prince. You may not possess his gifts like your brother, but I leave your bloodline and the sense shall compensate for what when I use the power on you to fill the tattoo, um, which we all now know. That's why Danica really put it on. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, Samantha believes the tattoo artist that, uh, <laughs> gave it to Bryce, uh, is Vaughn, <laughs> which I kind of love, uh, <laughs> the priestesses with the amulets, right? Save the books. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So just saying, there's some other people that I know that wear, that have a tattoo of a different language on their back. One may be like, I don't know. One is definitely another language. The other, I don't know. It could be like, you know, a certain bat looking fey people may have turned it into their own language a little bit but like it also is on her back I don't know I'm just I'm just saying <laughs> I'm just saying so uh then it's revealed that he killed Danica in the pack uh it says that she uh Dana could track down people for Redner. So what did she do for Redner Industries? I'm going to highlight this so I can remember to add this to our notes. Okay, so Dana could track down people that Redner wanted to find, people who didn't want to be found, including a group of Ophian, I think that's how you say that, rebels who were experimenting with a formula of synthetic magic to assist the human treachery. They dug into a long forgotten history and learned that the demons of Venom nullified magic. So these clever reb rebels decided to look into why and isolate the proteins that targeted the Venom, the source of magic. And then Renner's human spies tipped them off when Danica went, into, went to bring in research and the people behind it. Because Render knew the Asteri would shut down any uh, synthetic magic that I would shut it down. They spun the synth as a drug for healing. Render then invited me to invest, but earliest trials were success. With it, humans could heal faster than any medwitch or fey power, but the latter trials did not go according to plan. Vanir, we learned, went out of their minds when given it, and humans who took too much synth, well, Danica used security clearance to steal the footage with the trials, and I suspect she left it for you. Um... So, and then Micah explains that she made it very clear, that Danica made it very clear that she was very interested in this because of Bryce, because she wanted to keep her safe. Um, but I do think that there was more for it. Um, and then he's, and then she asks why he wants to, uh, why does he want the horn? And he says that he wants the horn um, because he's trying to essentially stop the human rebellion from getting to Lunathian. And he believes if he summons a place where he could kind of present himself as the all powerful being, then he could then cause the humans to never rebel in Lunathian. Um, so he says, for that, I need help from beyond our world. The horn will open a portal, then allow me to summon an army to decimate the human rebellions and their destruction. And she says, what world hell? And he said, hell would resist kneeling to me. But in ancient lore, whispers of other worlds that exist that would bow to a power like mine, bow to the horn. The one who possesses the horn, horn has the full power to do anything, even establish oneself as an asteri. Uh, says, with the horn, you would not need to inherit a star's magic to rule. Then the asteri would recognize that, welcome, you as one, welcome me as one of them. Uh, and then, so then if she says, he said, and then he explains that when he went to the apartment the night that Danica died, she never told him what happened to the horn. Um, but he realized in the two years that he was looking for it, uh, he needed to kind of do some planting. So that's kind of what he did. Um, he believed that Rune could have potentially led him to the horn. Rune says, every time I went to look for the horn, I would always have the urge to go back to Bryce. Um, and then Micah reveals that he was the one that was summoning the Crystalos demon. Um, and let's see. The horn's physical shape doesn't matter whether it was fashioned as a necklace or a horn uh, or a powder mixed in witch ink. The power still remains. Danica knew that the amulet would hide you from any detection or magic demonic. With that amulet, you were invisible to the Crystalos, bred to hunt the horn. I suspect she knew that Jessica Roba had similar enchantments upon this gallery. Perhaps Danica had placed some of on your apartment, your old one and the one she left for you, just to make sure you were even more veiled from it. Um... And then it says, uh, and basically, so Bryce was leading him on to a full confession because everyone's watching this all go down. Um, so then he tries to kind of go after her. He then grabs shrinks and throws them into the tank. Okay, 78. I just want to make sure everyone knows this. Um, this is going to be Crown of Midnight and Akatar spoilers. Akamath spoilers more specifically. So if you haven't gotten to Crown of Midnight, 
This isn't a huge spoiler if you have. Um, they're very, they're very minor spoilers, but I want to make sure you guys all paid attention. So on chapter 78, uh, Bryce uh, goes, she stretches her arm out to the shelf. Her ting, her fingers tingling brushes over the titles on the divine number, the walking dead, the book of breathings, the queen with many faces. So let me just go ahead and give you a very clear picture of what this is. On the divine number, I have no idea what that is. The Walking Dead is the book that uh, Selena finds in the library in Otterlin, which teaches her about word marks. Um, that is what she finds in Crown of Midnight. That book also appears later in the series, um, but that is when it is first shown up. The Book of Breathings is the book that uh, Reese and Feyre are working to get in Akamath. That is the big storyline in Akamath is getting the Book of Breathings. And it is also in an ancient archaic language that only Amran can read. Um, and then the Queen of Many Faces um, is assumed to be Aelin. So uh, just to kind of put it into... Um, Prefer just to kind of put it into the this is a very this is a literal crossover right here the walking dead and the book of breathings are both books that appeared in her other series isn't that cool it's very cool so the queen with many faces um at one point aelin is described to that later in the series the walking dead um that is a very important book in Throne of Glass. Um, it's what teaches Selena word marks. And then uh, the Book of Breathings is the huge book that's, I mean, at the end of Akawar, we know it was, um, okay, I guess Akawar spoilers. Akawar, uh, the book was thrown into the cauldron. So that was the last time we saw it. And then uh, The Walking Dead, I think the last time we saw it was with Dorian in Era Fire, I believe. Uh, but it does appear again potentially to Irene and Tower of Dawn. So there you go. That's the most obvious one. If you guys are impressed with that, you really should come to the crossover street because that's that's our most obvious one. And then we, we go even farther down the rabbit hole. Yeah, uh, the divine number is most likely seven um, because that's a divine number in Crescent City. So... Yes, uh, there you go. So that is kind of like, that's something I just really wanted to quickly highlight. Um, and then she does her ordeal, which is when she jumps into the tank and to save uh, strengths, that's 79. Um, they tell, basically everyone wants her to leave him, but she doesn't. Um, and then this is when Lahaba makes her big sacrifice. I won't go through that. I will let you guys um I will say that I think it's rude that Sarah J. Maas said, I'm not afraid because that line is reserved for throwing a glass. So thank you so much for that. Um, okay. And that is 79. So we have now gone through 78. Uh, then I just want to quickly say that 80 and 81, again, that is the shooting Micah and then vacuuming him up. Classic, probably one of the best things to read. I think I remember laughing out loud. Like I just thought it was so incredible. Um, so it is really good. Wait, what's going on in the, uh, it is, uh, it's really, uh, wild. Uh, hold on a second. Okay, so um, now moving on to um, eighty three and eighty four. Uh, the only thing I really wanted to go through with eighty three and eighty four is just talking about eighty three. The thing that I feel like is going to come up again is the and the only reason I wanted to highlight this chapter is it talks about the ox and how essentially the different ox units they only protected their section of Crescent City and so no one was there to protect the human side, which is 
really bad. And the only unit that was actually like willing to take anyone besides their own kind was the Many Waters. Many Waters was trying to grab as many people as they possibly could. The Fae stayed in the Fae side and then locked it up. The Wolves, after much protest, finally helped Bryce. Um, and it was actually all like... Uh, I, I, all canine shifters, I think is, is what it was described as. Um, so, uh, that was kind of the reason I wanted to highlight 83 and then 84 is the one, um, when you discover that, uh, that Ethan, um, that Ethan is there. So that was the main reasons I wanted to go over those chapters. Okay. Um, let's go to 80, uh, 86. 86 is the call. Um, this is again, a really great chapter to when you know that Bryce is the starborn Fae. So I'm going to read what she says. Um, so she says, hunt. I thought you would, it would go to audio mail. Help is coming soon. Bryce. No, it will be too late. Get to your apartment and stay there until hunt, uh, till help comes hunt. I need you to call my mom. Don't start making those kinds of goodbyes. I need you to tell her that I loved her and everything I am is because of her, her strength, her courage, her love. And I'm sorry for all the bullshit I put her through. Tell my dad, the autumn King stiffened, looked back towards hunt. Tell Randall. She clarified that I am so proud. I got to call him my father and that he was the only one that truly mattered uh Bryce I need you to move to safer ground tell Fury I'm sorry I lied that I would have told her the truth eventually uh across the room the assassin had tears coming down her face tell Juniper tell her thank you for that knife on the roof tell her I'd know why she stopped me from jumping it was so I could get here to help today tell Rune I forgive him I forgave him a long time ago I just didn't know how to tell him tell him I'm sorry I hid the truth and that I only did it because I loved him and didn't want to take anything away from him that he'll always be the better one of us agony on rune's face turned to confusion hunt uh bryce sweetheart get back to your apartment give me an hour and no she whispered i was waiting for you in here uh i was waiting for you to please uh bryce go now before uh more come through i forgive you for the shit with the synth all of it none of it matters anymore at the end she leaned uh Danica sword against the wall in the shelter alcove and placed her phone carefully on the ground next to it and ran for the gate so this is when Bryce says, uh, her hair drifted above her head, bits of debris floated up, up around her too, as if gravity ceased to exist. The light she held was so stark, it cast the rest of the world into grays and black. Slowly, her eyes opened, amber blazing like the first, first pure rays of dawn. A soft secret smile graced her mouth. Uh, I am Bryce Quinlan, heir to the starborn Fae. And then we get the beautiful uh, background between Bryce and Danica, which obviously is just really sweet. Um, like called to like, even the crystal demon with venom in her leg had not been able to stifle the essence of what she was. It blocked access to the light, but not uh, lay what stamped in her blood. The moment the venom had come out of her leg, uh, she felt awakened and free. And now here she was, the starlight building within her hands. Um so then chapter 88 is the call with the Autumn King and um, is the call with Autumn King and Ember. So Ember says, who do you think ended your goons all those years ago? Not me and Randall. They had her at a grasp by her neck. They held us at gunpoint. She realized what they were going to do to me and to Randall and she blinded them. What blinds an oracle? Light. Light the way a starborn fae has possessed it. Uh, the books claim there were multiple starborns. The first wars I told her and she already knew. Uh, who knew? The priestesses? No, only me and Randall, Ember said. And Danica, she and Bryce got into serious trouble in college and came out then she blinded the males at the time her test showed no power the autumn king spat yes amber said quietly they were correct it is a gift of starlight light and nothing more it was never meant to any of us but to your people when bryce was 13 she agreed to visit you to meet you to see if you could be trusted to know that she possessed and not threatened by it uh, but then she met your son and she told me that you saw the pride in his chosen one status. She realized she couldn't take it away from him, not when she saw that the only value you placed into him, even if it meant she would be denied everything she was due, even if revealing herself would have meant she could lord it over you. She couldn't do that to room because she loved him more than she hated you. And then you left her on the curve like garbage. I hope she returns the favor, you effing asshole. <laughs> she had that.
Incredible. So it says, uh, Adis had known, had watched all these years waiting to reveal itself. Um, and then, uh, Sandriel then causes some issues cause she calls the Asiri, tells them what's going on. Um, and they realize that, uh, they're going to, um, what Sandriel did. Hypexia takes the thorn off of Hunt's brow and 89, um, is when we see Hunt's magic go crazy. So um, I'm just going to read the part where it says, uh, okay, he let the archangel's head drop. It thumped and lulled to the side, smoke still trickling from the mouth, the nostrils. He filleted her with his lightning inside out. The angels in the room all knelt to one knee, bowed even a uh, wide-eyed Isaiah. No one in the planet had that sort of power. No one had seen it fully unleashed in centuries which I think is important. Uh, okay. So, um, that was all of that. All right. Let's go to the drop 92 and 93 Danica sacrifice. So we're going to quickly go to that. So, uh, the reason I want to talk about the drop is I want to talk about, uh, specifically what Bryce gets. So, they say that Bryce is gaining speed. Uh, it says, Hypexia, I don't think it's a memorial plaque on the gate. The power shall belong to those who live their lives, give their lives to the city. The plaque is a blessing. Then Declan's breathing uneven as he murmured, the power of the gates, the power given over by every soul who ever touched it, every soul who ever handed over a drop of their magic. Millions and millions of drops fueled this solo drop. Uh, so Bryce passed level after level. The autumn's king face went pale. Look at the gates. The court's gate across the city began to grow glow red then orange then gold then white first light abrupted uh, erupted from them lines of the speared out in every direction the lights flowed down the ley lines between the gates connecting them all the main avenues it formed a six-pointed star formed a six-pointed star avery uh the <laughs> lines i'll highlight that for us I don't think we've seen six points. Uh, light met after life and Bryce was still making the drop. Uh, their souls were intertwined. Um, she then passed runes level. Uh, Declan's king was still as death as Bryce smashed past runes ranking. This could change the very order. Powerful half human princess with the starlight in her veins. Then Bryce began to slow at last nearing the autumn king's level. Um, the city, the lights shone up, seven bolts of the heart city, the void between Midgard and hell began to shrink as if light itself became, uh, as if the pure unstrained first light could heal the world. Bryce slowed further. Uh, the voids of the gate became smaller and smaller. Uh, Bryce stopped at last. Uh, Declan studied the precise number of power, just a decimal point above that of the autumn king. Um, and then the autumn King said, because the girl have used the gates to power unforeseen levels, but she will not be able to make the ascent. Uh, the autumn King laughed, not from malice Declan realized, but from something of pain. He never known the prick to show such a thing. And then it says that, the, uh, no true anchor. So then we're going to go to 93. I just want to read some of Danica's, um, stuff. So she's, so first Bryce says, are you alive over there? I mean, no, Danica shook your, her head. No, Bryce, this is what you see. Uh, this, what you see, she gestured to herself is just the spark that's left. What's resting? What was resting over there? But it's you. Yes. Uh, you don't have much time. Make the ascent. Bryce, Bryce says she's not going to, uh, she, then Bryce says that she's just, she's giving her a hard time about giving up. Um, and she, Bryce then tells her, I miss you every moment of the day. Danica says, I know I felt it and I've seen it. Uh, she goes, why did you lie about the horn? I didn't lie. Danica said simply, I just didn't tell you. You lied about the tattoo Bryce countered to keep you safe, to keep the horn safe, but mostly to keep you safe in case the worst happened to me. Uh, and then she said that they all saw what, um, Bryce had did to the, um, to Micah. And then she said, is Connor with you? He is the rest of the pack. They brought me time. They bought me time with the Reapers to get to the gate. They're holding them off, but not for long. Bryce, I can't stay with you. Um, so I think that's important. The Reapers somehow got involved. Uh, 
And then Danica asks about the angel and Danica says, if you want to ignore the fact that you've got family who loves you no matter what, but the angel remains, you're really trying to convince me to make the ascent for a guy. Is Hunt Athalar really some guy to you, Danica said? And why is this somehow a mark against the strength to admit that there's someone who happens to be male worth uh, returning to? Someone who I know makes you feel uh, like things are far from effed. Um, he's healed Bryce. You healed him with first light. Um and then this is when it says the beautiful line about I'm scared. And Danica says, that's the poise, Bryce, all of life to live, to love, knowing it might all vanish tomorrow. It makes everything that more precious. Um, and then Danica tells her, just try. And so then she starts to make her ascent. OK, that is that chapter. So that's a really obviously important one. Um, OK, then we go to 94 and... Oh, sorry, 95 and 96. So 95 is when they go back to the apartment. Um, uh, he tells her that she killed Sandriel. She says, I killed Micah. He says, I know. Remind me never to get on your bad side. Uh, then... Then he looks at her chest as glimps, uh, as if glimpsing the shimmering beneath her skin. When his eyebrows flick upward, Bryce followed the sight. Well, that's new. There was a vi um, indeed a visible... Uh, just visible down the V of her t-shirt, a white splotch, an eight-pointed uh, star now scarred at the place between her breasts. Um, and so then she says, uh, you know it's just starboard light, not true power. And he says, but you got a good amount from what I can sense and the horn, whatever, you're going to have to learn to control it. We saved the city and you're already telling me to get back to work. Um, so then they kiss, blah, blah, blah. Then they try to have hanky panky, but then Ember calls. Um, and Ember also tries to say they know the exact amount of power you got as much as he has more than him. That's a big deal. What are you going to do? Open a chain of restaurants. Was too much hope achieving that much power? We give you a sense of dignity. Uh, so then they talk a little bit more. Uh and then Isaiah, so then Hunt calls Isaiah. He says he's now in charge, uh, but he needs, uh, he needs Hunt to come over and kind of help. They say that Naomi is still alive. Uh, Justinian is dead, <laughs> which obviously he was dead. And then I just want to quickly say the thing that bothers me the most is the fact that Victoria is still at the bottom of the ocean. Sarah G. Mass, I would really like to know if we're going to get Victoria back because I think I'm still haunted by the fact that she's just in a jar at the bottom of the ocean and we have no resolution to that. So can we please go back to that? That would be really nice. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, so then we're going to talk about the Asteri. So then uh, someone calls. She knew the voice uh, and knew the lanky teenage boy body it belonged to, the shell of a house of an ancient behemoth. To the house, the Asteri. She'd seen it on TV so many times she lost count. Um, Regulus, the bright hand of the Asteri, had called her house. Uh, Bryce's hand shook so badly she could barely keep the phone in her ear. We beheld your actions today. We wish to extend our gratitude. Um... To show how deep our gratitude goes, we'd like to grant you a favor. Uh, that's not necessary. It's already done. We hope you find it satisfactory. She knew Hunt could hear the voice, but he held out his wrist, uh, his tattooed wrist with the stamp C on the slave mark. Um, we also trust that the favor will serve as a reminder to you and Hunt Athalar. It is our deepest wish that you remain in the city and live out your days in peace uh, and contentment, that you use your ancestor's gift to bring you self-joy and refrain from using the other gift inked behind you upon you uh governor and she goes what about micah and sandriel governor micah went ro rogue and threatened to destroy innocent citizens of this of his this empire with his high-handed approach of the rebel conflict governor sandriel got what she deserved being so lax uh with her control over the slaves um so then they kind of threaten her a little bit um, he says that they take the full responsibility of the destruction of Lunathian. We were informed by Sandra that the city was evacuated and sent the guard to wipe away the demon infestation. The brimstone missiles were a last resort intended to save us all. It was an incredible fortunate that you found another solution. They realized that this is a lie. Uh, so then they kind of threaten her a little bit more about the power, uh, and then they say, live quietly and normally, keep your mouth shut and never use the horn and we won't kill you and everyone you love. Uh, so then they both decide to go to the uh, committee together to kind of be a little bit scary. 
Uh, then she runs into Rune uh, and Juniper, or she runs into Rune and Fury. Fury gives her a hug and then goes to get Juniper. Uh, Rune then begins to babble, saying that Theron went to help uh, get the evacuees out of the blue court. Emil ran to the den to make sure the pups were okay. We were nearly um, half a mile away when we heard the Moonwood Gate. Uh, heard you talking through it. Um, Rune said he thought he was dead. Thought she was dead. I'm glad to disappoint you. Shut up, Bryce. He scanned her face. His cheeks were wet. Are you all right? You are my sister. Uh, and he didn't bother to keep his voice down. Of course, I'd come to save your ass. Did you mean what you said to Athlar about me? Uh, tell Rune I forgive him. Yes. Um, he says, I don't care if I'm this prince or starborn or chosen one or any of that. The only thing I want to be called is your brother. Uh, you know the Autumn King will want to meet you. Be ready. Doesn't getting a bunch of fancy ass power mean I don't have to obey anyone? And just because I forgive you doesn't mean I forgive him. I know, Rune's eyes gleamed, but be on your guard. Um, and then she says, Hunt told me about the mind reading. It's not mind reading, it's mind talking, telep uh, telepathy. So just to keep that um, in the back of your mind. Um, and uh, that's about it. So then think leave. Um, okay, let's talk epilogue. So, uh, important things to kind of note here. So Jezeba is sitting, there's a white cat and Jezeba are sitting on a bench in front in Oracle's park. Uh, Jezeba then asks, why didn't you tell me about Bryce? And he flexed his claws. I didn't trust anyone, even you. I thought Thea's light was forever extinguished. So did I. I thought they made sure she and her power died on the last battlefield under Prince Peleus's blade. But Bryce Quinlan bears her light. You could tell the difference between Bryce's and her brother's. I should never forget the exact shine and hue of Thea's light. It is still a song in my blood. And Hunt Athelar. Uh, Adis fell silent. Um, uh, Petitioner stumbled past, hoping to beat the crowds that filled Oracle's par uh, park and Luna's temple since portals to his world had opened within the court's gates. The beasts of the pit had taken full advantage of it. Any who managed to return were currently being punished by one of Adis's brothers. He would soon return to join him. Ada said, I think Athelar's father would be proud. Sentimental of you? Ada shrugged. Feel free to disagree, of course. You knew the mail best. Uh, what of the library? It's already been moved. Good. Jezeba didn't speak um, again until the fifth prince of hell stalked a few, we do, few, do, few feet away. Don't uh, mess with us this time, Adis. I don't plan to, he said. Not when things are about to get so interesting. And that is Crescent City. There you go. That is all of Crescent City. We just went through it. How long did I do? Let's see. A little, a little under two hours. So, I mean, my biggest theory is, is that the seventh prince of hell is Hunt's father because Adis knows him. Jezeba knows him. It feels very poetic to make it him. Um, I think we're going to get a lot of Adis, uh, a lot of Adis and Adis's backstory in the second book. Actually, she confirmed that in a live. So that will be very interesting. Um, and yeah, that was Crescent City. So, anything else y'all want to go over? I'm going to give you a second. I'm going to blow my nose while I wait. I see you guys are reacting to Agatha's. <laughs> Uh, okay. Kitty cat man. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, theories on why Hunt's wings are the only gray ones. Maybe because the seventh prince of hell is his father. It would make him, uh, obviously different from the other, other angels and people would notice. Yeah. I mean, they do mention that other angels have different shades, like different colored wings. Um, but yeah, we didn't get anything on Thea, right? Just the epilogue. Uh, she's brought up in the epilogue and as well in... I believe it is chapter 
29. Yep, 29. Um, yeah, what's the ordeal they mention uh, they go through for the drop? Okay, so I can explain the ordeal. The ordeal is brought up in chapter 14. Um, and, um, it's specifically, it's casually brought up when, uh, is it chapter 14? Wait. Uh, no, is it chapter 16? Chapter 16. Okay. The ordeal itself, so it's only for Faye. Um, the ordeal itself varied depending on the person. For some, it might be, uh, it might be as overcoming an illness or a bit of personal strife. For others, it might be slaying a worm or a demon. The greater the Faye, the greater the ordeal. Uh, so it's essentially just kind of a process that Faye go through that is part of, it's like a trial, essentially. Um, was he saying Thea's life was the same as Bryce's? Yes, he was. Uh, is the next book going to be focused on Rune and the new queen? I don't know, but I do think that they will be um, heavily featured in there. Um, so yeah, so excited for the crossover talk. Yeah, we're going to go wild for that. The crossover conversation is going to be insane. I wonder why Peleus had to kill the queen. Yeah, because Peleus was the one that was in love with the queen's daughter. So it's a bit of an interesting kind of um, thing. For anyone who's looking at the notes, it's in chapter 29, The Great Romances of the Fae. That's what I titled it. Um, <laughs> Avery, I see, is like trying to find it too. I'm just going to put this here. This is why these are the. <laughs> the anonymous notes. There we go. <laughs> uh, Peleus isn't the prince from hell. No, Peleus is the. Here. Peleus is mentioned in chapter four. No, not 14. Uh, mm, hold on. He is mentioned in. Peleus is. Luna's Temple, chapter 21. So if you go to that chapter, uh, Peleus was the first one to wield the horn, um, but he he was Prince Peleus. Uh, but he... Da, 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 da. Um, okay, wait, let me go back to the great romances of the Fae because it's, it's like, if you go back between those two, uh, okay. So Prince Peleus was, uh, so it says, I, okay, so this is what Rune says about Prince Peleus. So it says, this is just a three page account of Prince Peleus and his bride, Lady Helena. But I didn't realize that Peleus was actually Actually, the high general for a fey queen named Thea who entered the world during the crossing. Helena was her daughter. From what it sounds like, Queen Thea was also starborn and her daughter possessed the same power. Thea had a young daughter with the same gift, but only Lady Helena is mentioned. So it doesn't, I don't think Helena died. I mean, it doesn't say, I mean, obviously she did die, but it doesn't say that he was a part of it. But Queen Thea, Thea, uh, died from, uh, Peleus. So it, it sounds to me like Thea had the starboard and then Helena did. And then obviously, uh, Pe Peleus did, but he had the horn, um, which is a little different. Uh, I'm asking questions for clarification because I feel like it's super important. Yeah, that's totally true. Uh, Remember that other daughter. Yeah, I would agree. Because when why would why would she say she had a younger daughter with the same gift, but only Lady Helena was mentioned? Well, who's the other daughter? It's just it's a little it's a little sus. It's a little sus. Uh, 
So yeah, that is kind of the information about Thea, uh, Helena, and Prince Peleus, which I do think will come up, I'm assuming, if we get more into that Starborn stuff. Uh, the younger daughter's probably going to be important. Probably. That would not surprise me. That would not surprise me at all. Um, yeah, it's just a, it's a very interesting development. Younger daughter with no name. Yeah, you know who I bet has the information on that? The Avalyn Fay. The Avalyn Fay, who have insane archives that we can't see, who's ruled by the Stag King. I'm just saying. Just saying. Just saying. Nameless, stop. <laughs> uh. Y'all are so bad. Y'all are so bad. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, friends. Any other last minute questions, comments, concerns before we wrap this up? Before we call it a day and we wrap it up. Does the Autumn King have a name? No. Uh, did Peleus wield the blade that we talked about earlier? Yes. He did. I believe. Uh, bring this woman to Avalon. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. I want to go to Avalon. I want to, I want to meet the Fae there. I want to be like, hey, I have a lot of questions. Do you know what a word mark is? Can I show you how to open and close things with a word mark? Anyone here transform into a hawk? Anyone related to someone who transforms into a hawk? Specifically a silver-tailed. It's okay if you can't. Anyone here transform into a bird? But not a, what's it called? Not a raptor bird. No white thorn is a raptor. Uh, how is Bryce a starborn fae? Uh, from her father's line. Uh, I feel like it ties to Rune's oracle reading since the all starborns are royalty. Probably. Still maintain that the vacuum is my favorite character. Right? Uh, I bet his name starts with a D. <laughs> yeah. So. Just say Take it off. Right? Right? I'm just saying, look, I have questions, comments, and concerns. Mainly, I would like to see someone transform into um, a bird, but not a raptor, a bird, you know? <laughs> Take it off. Hey, right. <laughs> you know, just a bird. Isn't a hawk a raptor? Great question. I don't know. All I know is in Kingdom of Ash, it states that none of them are white thorns because they're not, they're all raptors. Wait, hold on. Let me read the passage again. Because I remember highlighting it. Is it sad that I know exactly what chapter it is? Or I know around the chapter it is? Um, 26? No. 27? No. 25. No. 23? No. 21? 21. Um. Wait. I remember this passage. If you're a bird, I'm a bird. Wait, I'm just going to look it up. There we go. Found it. What chapter is it? Oh, I was close. It was, I was, I was on this chapter. What chapter is this? It's page 210. It's
It says, okay, it says raptors mostly. They've always been the sharpest of scouts. I didn't recognize any from your house. So they could be a raptor, but like it's implied that somehow they knew that it wasn't from that house. I, look, I don't know, okay? I just thought this line was very confusing <laughs> from the Kingdom of Ash, okay? I found it, I found it. It's in chapter 23. I knew I, guys, I'm so good. No, it's not chapter 23. What chapter is it? Yeah, it is chapter 23. I'm so good. Yeah, chapter 23, right there. Kingdom of Ash. <laughs> chapter 19? Wait, what happened in chapter 19? It's a Kale and Irene chapter. Okay, I don't want to get you crossovery. But see, you could, I know, I, I know. <laughs> That's really scary. <laughs> Let's never tell SJM that I know that. <laughs> Let's make a pack right now to never reveal that. Um, okay. I am going to, anything else? Anything, any last minute comments, questions, concerns? Be told before I sign off for the evening. Um, so just so you guys know, the next time I'm live is next week. We're having our crossover conversation. That is a full SJM spoiler conversation. That means everything is open. Throne of Glass, Crescent City, Akatar, all of it open. Not Catwoman. I don't, I haven't read that yet, but, uh, we're going to be talking crossovers. We're going to wait. I don't know. Ignore me. I was in the wrong book. Ugh. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to start with the most obvious stuff. The most obvious crossover stuff, one of them obviously being the books that we just talked about. And then we're going to move into the more obscure theories um, as the uh, as the night progresses. No, go play video games. I know I need to I need to go do this. So we will start with the most obvious ones and then we will move into the really obscure ones. Um, so it, this it will be just be very uh, chaotic. Expect lots of craziness. Um, you will probably get book references. So if you have a Kindle edition or anything, you can bust them out and kind of hear us uh, just really go crazy. Um, yeah, so thank you guys for hanging out. I really appreciate it. I hope you guys enjoyed this live stream. I hope it's uh, this has been really helpful like for anyone who's watching this recording. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if for some reason Sarah J Mass is watching this, I promise I'm not obsessive, okay? Your books are just great and I dive into them. And um, if you need someone to help you with your lore, just call me because I have over 75 pages on Crescent City and over 600 pages on Throne of Glass. So happy to be your lore expert. Um, okay, I am going to sign off. We are getting so, so, so close to um, all of the fun stuff. Oh, and then we have a we have our Fangs and Bangs, Fangs and Bangs night coming up. I was supposed to do that this week and I totally forgot. So we'll have to push it. I'll figure out a time to do fangs and bangs. Um, and uh, Spicy Book Club pick Electric Idol for February. So if you want to join our Spicy Book Club, it's for Patreon. Um, we're reading Electric Idol. Um, I reached out to Katie Roberts to see if she was interested. I don't know if she is. Um, and that's about it. So thank you guys um, for, we'll start coherent and then spiral. That's, yeah, that sounds about right. Um, I am now going to go call Kaylee because I know she's waiting. It's 10 o'clock, baby's asleep now. So I'm gonna call Kaylee and tell her uh, we can play a video game together. Don't know what we're gonna play. Are the boys on? We have boys that we play with. Oh, they are! What are they playing? Oh, they're playing Genshin. Are they all playing Genshin? Yeah, they are. I don't know if we'll play Genshin tonight. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm not obsessive. Shut up, Avery. <laughs> okay. Bye, friends. Have an amazing night. I'm going to turn the music on so you guys can enjoy it. We'll see you all later. Bye. Oh, um, 